God gives you a promise, but he also gives you commands and instructions. And you have to do what he said. Then will come the glory. Then will come the miracle. Then will come the fulfillment of his word. First you have the tent, then you have the temple, then you have the new temple. Same thing. What you see is the glory of God filling each house. They build it and he comes. There's the building, the setting up, then comes the glory of God. The principle is that. First comes a promise. God says, I will do this. Secondly, he gives a command for his people, instructions for them to do something. Number three comes their obedience. They, they follow it. They build it. They follow the instructions. Four, the glory of God comes. So first the promise, then the instructions, then the doing of it, and then the glory of God. God said he would show his glory to them. His glory would be with them. But then he gave them the blueprints. You have glory and you have blueprints. You have blueprints and you have glory. There are the blueprints of the glory, which is what um, this message is about. If you want the glory, you got to go with the blueprint. That's, that's the principle right now throughout the Bible. And you see throughout, God gives a promise to Israel, I'm going to take you out of Egypt. Then he gives them instructions. Okay, uh, on this day, take a lamb. This is the Passover lamb. And then do this, this, this. They obedient. He gives instructions. They obey. Then comes the glory. They are, they are set free from Egypt. Jericho. It's a promise. I'm going to bring you into the land. Instructions or the command. You must do this. I want you to circle the city seven days, seven times, seven priests with seven shofars. God likes seven. Sound it with a shout. And, the wall, and so they, they do it. They, instruct, they do it. They fulfill it. And the walls come tumbling down. Here's another one. There's a leper. The, man, the man's name is Naaman or Naaman. And he, he is told you can get healed by this. Go to this guy. Go to the prophet. He goes to the prophet. The prophet gives them instructions. Okay, you want to be healed of leprosy? Go down to the Jordan River. Dip yourself seven times. So he, he doesn't want to do it because it's, he said, I, I have better rivers where I am than, than here. To do that, I'm not going to, but they say, listen, just do it. So he goes down, he goes to the, the Jordan River, has a baptism, seven baptisms of himself, comes out, his skin is like a baby. Same pattern, same thing. Now you look at the Bible, the Bible is filled with promises, filled with them. But most believers do not see them all in their life. Some don't see hardly any. And they'll say, well, it's not really for me. It's not really true. Or God didn't, come God didn't come true with this. But look at the pattern here. This is so important. Look at the pattern. God gives you a promise. But he also gives you commands and instructions. And you have to do what he said. Then will come the glory. Then will come the miracle. Then will come the fulfillment of his word. That is guaranteed because God keeps his word. May not be the way we say it. We see it. It doesn't matter. But God keeps his word. You wouldn't have a nation of Israel today if God didn't keep his word for 4,000 years. He's certainly going to keep his word to you, but you got to do it his way. If you never fully do it his way, you cannot expect the result that he promised. You might say, you know, well, I don't have that. I mean, you know, they had that. You know, God told them with Jericho. God told Naaman. You know, you might, but you know, you know, he hasn't told me to go to a river. He hasn't told me to do that. But he has. Because when you think about some of these commands, some of these commands seem arbitrary. Like, why do I have to dip myself in the... Now, there's a whole mystery to that. But why do I have to do that? Why do I have to do that? Why do I have to walk around seven times? You know, I'm not going to go through it, but... But you know, you know, you know, God just put on my heart with the old building in Garfield that if we wanted it, we had to walk around it seven times. And we did. I'm not going to go through it. It was like a dramatic, crazy thing. We all, the board did it at 12 midnight. The next day we got the building, which we couldn't get before. It doesn't matter, but they seem kind of arbitrary. 
But you know, God has given you instructions and commands that aren't arbitrary. They're actually, they have moral value. They're actually, they're, they're all right. They're all completely, you can see why. And the things that God says when God gives instructions to you in the Bible, he may give other instructions to you, but it, certainly you've got to start with the Bible because that's his word. In the Bible are instructions for your life. And the thing is, all those instructions are keys or are releases to what God has. When you do them, there is going to be a blessing. They are like triggers, releases, catalysts to miracles or the fulfillment of God's Word. You know, God does His part. He's never going to not do His part. So where's the issue? It's with us. The Bible is filled with promises, but the promises have instructions. They have blueprints that trigger the fulfillment. Let me show you. For example, we want forgiveness. We want to be refreshed. We want to be renewed. We want to be revived. There is a guaranteed way of being revived. That Bible gives, he, he gives the instructions. And I'm going to show you one right here. Acts 3.19 says this. Repent and turn again that your sins may be washed away and that times of refreshing or renewing or revival may come from the presence of the Lord. We want the revival, but we don't always do the repentance. Repentance opens up revival like nothing else. You know, if I had to say the two things for revival, repentance and prayer, more than anything else. Repent. You want blessing. You want revival. You want refreshing. Do what God said. Stop doing what God said not to do. Turn, and there will be blessing in your life. That, that's the blueprint. God pro now, does God promise prosperity? Yes, but not necessarily the way it's preached. Does it have to be financial? No. Does it have to be physical? No. Does it have to be that new Cadillac? No. God didn't promise that. He promised to bless you. He promises to give you what you need and true prosperity. It could involve all those things. It could involve none of those things. doesn't matter. But prosperity, yes. That's the glory part. What's the blueprint? The Bible says, you know, it says you want this thing. It says, it says, give and it shall be given to you. There's the blueprint. You don't give, it's not going to be given to you. Give and it shall be given to you. It releases it. All those things, it's saying as you do, it shall be done to you. How about all the worries you may have in your life? You know, you're worrying about what you should eat, what to drink, your clothing, your finances, all these things. Is there a promise? There is a promise. It says all these things will be added to you. But there's a blueprint. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things shall be added to you. If you don't do the first, you cannot sit around saying God didn't do the second. Here's a promise. What if you could have unbound energy. You know, you know, a lot of you get tired. You know, unbound energy. You, you can kind of soar through life. Imagine that. Above problem. Imagine that. Well, that, that, that is a problem. That's a glory there. But there's a blueprint. You know what the blueprint is? Those who wait upon the Lord. They shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of eagles. They shall run and not get weary. Wait upon the Lord. So are you spending time in God's presence? If you're not spending time in God's presence, you're not going to be renewed. That renews you. How about a, how about a promise that, that about doing even greater things than Messiah did? Well, the Bible says that. He said it. Not, not, now, not, not that you can, we're, not, we're just we're ourselves, but God gives us the power. That's the glory. But he says, believe on me and you will do greater things. All right. Therefore, but it's true belief. It's not the belief we often say. If you want your life to be fruitful, you want to fulfill the purpose while you're on earth, there's a guarantee on that. It says, he says, here's the release. He says, here's the blueprint. Abide in me and I in you. Yes. And, and, and you will be fruitful. You will bear much fruit. But what does that mean? It means if you're not spending time in God's presence abiding in him, you can't be fruitful. But if you are spending time truly in his presence, receiving of God, you will be fruitful. That's a promise from God. That is a promise of God. Here's another one. What if there was a promise, and you know this one, you're going to be ahead of me here, but what if there was a promise that you could get, you could, you could get whatever your heart desires you're going to get? Well, yes, 
But there is a blueprint. There are instructions. What is that? What's, what's the trigger? What is the key here? Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Now does that mean you could ask for it? No, no, no. It's got to be according to God's will. But if you delight in God, you're going you're gonna to ask according to His will. Your desire of your heart is going to be of God. And He's going to give it to you. But if you're not delighting in God, you can't get the second part. There are people who preach, you just say whatever you want. You know, not at all. That's not the Bible. That, that's, that can, you know, the Bible says if it's according to His will, number one. Number two, delight yourself in God and He will give you the desires of your heart. So do the first part. He'll take care of the second part. So, so, so many of us are, many people are seeking the second part. Let me try to get the desire. Let me try to get what I desire. God doesn't say, He says, delight in me. I will take care of that. How about... Can you, what if you could change the course of history? You can, you can change the course of an entire nation. Well, the Bible says you can. I mean, there are conditions here, but one of them is this. It's if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their evil ways. Then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. Now I'm not going to go into it, but I've seen God actually do that. I've seen God do that in my life. I mean, when I was a new believer, I saw him actually turn history. And actually, I, I haven't gone into all the things, but he actually did that at the return as well when we were, we were together in Washington. I, I, will, I will speak about that at another time, but to the exact second. Now, now you know, we often... Sometimes people think, well, you know, well, isn't that works? If I have to do that, isn't that works? Not, not at all. You're not making a miracle. You're not making glory. You're not doing that. All you're doing is open the door for it. They, you know, they didn't make any glory, but they, they, made a, they made a vessel for him to go into. They made a tabernacle. They made a temple. And God went into it because it was his will. So no, you don't do anything you, know, you cannot make a blessing. You cannot generate a blessing. You cannot generate, I can't generate a miracle or glory. But I can open up the door for the miracle and the glory and the blessing that God has. Isaac was given a blessing. He was giving a blessing to his sons, right? But only one of them got the real blessing. And it was the one he didn't want to bless. It was the one he thought, well, not that he didn't like his son, but the son was the younger one. He wasn't supposed to get that blessing, according to man. So Isaac, blessing, the blessing was coming no matter what. Jacob said, no, I'm going to do everything I can to get that blessing. Jacob did not produce the blessing. He didn't make the blessing. He didn't do a thing. All he did was do everything he could to get that blessing, to receive the blessing. See, a blessing has two parts. The first part is the giving, but that's half of it. Is that all the blessings there, but that's half for you're not going to it doesn't mean you're going to get it. The second part is receiving it. The Lord died for you on Calvary. He did everything was done on Calvary for me everything I got, but it means nothing if you don't receive it for your life. So the more you receive it, the more you're blessed. The blessing's already there. The the one who's the most blessed is the one who gets real good at receiving the blessing. And part of the receiving the blessing is doing what God said. The problem's not with God. He blesses. If you're not living in His will, you cannot, you cannot expect the blessings of God. Now some might say, well, well um, I, I, I gave my life to the Lord. You know, I'm in His will. I, I repented. But it doesn't say just repent once. It says turn again. That you, you don't stop. You don't just do it once. You seek God every day. You ask for him in your life every day. Yes, you're saved, but you ask for You turn every day. You know, Paul never stopped repenting. His whole life was repentance. You know, some might say, well, oh, okay, it says given, it shall be given. Well, I've given things, you know, but, but you know, it says give. Do it with your whole heart. Do it abundantly. Do it, in a, do it with your full heart. If you're not doing it with a full heart, whatever you're supposed to do, if you don't do it with a full heart, how can you expect God to do it with a full heart? It says, seek first. That doesn't mean just, yeah, I found God. It means I'm going to seek you every day, God. The more I seek you, I'm going to seek you more than anything else in my life. Are you seeking him first? He said, if you do, you're going to be blessed. That means what's the first thing you want to do in, in the day? Seek God. Then you're seeking him first. Lord, more than I want anything else, I want to seek you. Then the promise kicks in. 
Because a lot of times we're not doing it, we're not quite doing what he said. You know, it says if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be removed, it shall be removed. Now, it's not that God wants you to go around moving always physical mountains. It's a figure of speech, although God could do it. But what it's saying, if you're not seeing mountains move in your life, then you say, well, I have faith. Well, maybe you don't have the faith he said. Because he's saying if you have real faith, not just theoretical faith, not just religious faith, real faith, and even if it's the smallest thing, you're going to be able to do the greatest thing. Even a mustard seed. But I'm real, Lord, I'm really believing you. You know, I want to mount up with wings of eagle. Am I really waiting on the Lord? Do I even know what that means? Those who wait upon the Lord, I'm in God's presence. Lord, I'm trusting you. I am going to mount up. Believe. You know, you want to be used for the high purpose of God? There is a blueprint there. It says, if anyone will cleanse himself of these things, these, these low purposes, these bad purposes, if anyone will cleanse himself, God will make him or her a vessel of honor. And he's going to use you for great, great things. It's kind of like if you have a, you have a piece of fine china and you're using it as a, as a bucket for a mop, you can never lift that thing up in your house because it's dirty. So even if you're meant to be a great vessel of God, if you're filled with all this dirty thing, he can't lift you up. So therefore it says just cleanse yourself and he will lift you up as a vessel of honor. Amen. What about flowing in the Spirit? It says, he said, he said you will, he want, his will is to let you flow in the Spirit but there's a condition. If any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Are you really coming to him and drinking? If you want to be filled and flowing, are you really coming to him? Lord, I'm coming to you and I'm drinking of you. You know, sometimes, you know, it, it says abide in me. You know, there, we, we, we kind of do things half-hearted and then we expect the, the blessing of God. God says go full blast. Go full blast. If you do this, I will do that. What if you could guarantee, I mean, just like you could guarantee these things because God's Word is good. I've seen it again and again. It doesn't mean it happens always in our timing or always the way we think. But God says that. It, but you've got to go full blast with it. The Bible says all the promises of God are good, are yes in Messiah. So if all the promises in God, if they're yes, and we're not seeing them, then there's something on our part. Sometimes we dishonor God, and we don't realize we're doing it. In a way, we would never dishonor the world. Let me give you an example. Let's say you go to motor vehicles. It's always a great experience. And you have to get a driver's license and say it's your first time. You've got to study. You've got you to actually pass that test. You've got to go for the, well, well, let's just say, you know what? I just want to drive. I don't want to drive. I don't want to, have to, I don't want to have to go through all that stuff. I just want to drive. But you didn't follow what they said and you start crashing into things and one day a policeman pulls you over, asks for your license. He says, but officer, I just wanted to drive. You'll get punished. Imagine you, you, imagine you said, well, you know what? This is not good. The government lied and said I could drive. No, there was a condition there. We would never do that to the world, yet we do it to God. We just want the blessing. Well, that's good. Let, let, let's, say, let's say you want to be a surgeon. You have to do well in school. You got to go to college. You got to go to medical school. Years, study, sacrificing a lot. An apprentice and then perform your first operation. But you see a commercial about being a doctor. You say, you know, that sounds good. I want to be a surgeon. But I don't want to go through all that. So you go to the hospital. You put on surgeon's clothes. You put on a mask. Go into the operating room. Somebody's waiting for an operation. You start, the person says, wait, are you a surgeon? You say, no, but I've always wanted to operate. <laughs> and you get thrown in jail. That's what would happen. It doesn't work. Or let's say you see an advertisement of skydiving. You say, that looks great. And there's a course. You've got to go through all that stuff, you know. But you say, I don't want to go through that. I just want to skydive. So you jump off. You don't do it right. Your parachute doesn't open. You're heading down to earth faster and faster. And you're irritated. You're upset that it didn't work for you. That would be crazy, but we do it to God. We want the blessing, but we don't do what He said. In the way of following His will, that's the blessing. You want it, it's good, but you got to do it His way. Did you really follow Him with all your heart? Are you really doing that? I mean, are you really going all out for God? Are you really doing as He said? 
Think about how much effort people put into learning. You know, they, 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 they go to school, they do years and years of this, and how much do we put into following God's will? People from all walks of life will put in hours and hours and hours, years of seeking a goal, but how much are we doing it, putting it into holiness, into God's will? Messiah saw a man born blind. He told him, you want to be healed? He did a strange thing, and then he said, go down to the pool of Siloam and wash. Now how's that going to give him sight? The blind man can say, no, I just want to get, I don't want to get healed. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The miracle is free, but do God does give his will. He gives a command, go down to the pool of Siloam. Do you realize what that means? If you, how many of you have been to Israel? You know what that means? If you're on the Temple Mount, you're going down to the Pool of Siloam, you're going, you're going downhill a long way. A, a rocky downhill for a long walk, and the guy is blind. The guy is blind. He can't even see what he's doing. Somebody has to be leading him. And even then, he doesn't know where he's going, and it's, it's treacherous when you, you don't have eyes. He doesn't see any sign of miracles, but he obeys the word that Jesus gave him. He makes an effort. He says, I'm going to obey you. I'm gonna, why, you know, what do I have to lose? Maybe he falls, maybe he scratches himself, take, but he takes it seriously. He took the Lord seriously and did exactly what he said. God gave him a promise. God gave him an instruction. He fulfilled the instruction. The result was, for the first time in his life, he can see. All this goes back to the tabernacle, back to the temple, back to the vision of the prophet. God wants to show his glory. God wants to bless his people. That means you. He wants to dwell. He actually wants us to be filled with him like the temple and the tabernacle, overflowing with glory, a glorious life. That's what he wants for you. But our part is to open the way. All those details of the tabernacle, everything they did, line upon line and measurement upon measurement, they were all acts of obedience. That if we really trust Him and we really love Him, that we're going to do everything we can. Lord, I want to do it right for you. I don't want to say this and then I keep doing that. I'm, you know, start with that thing. But I want to do what you said. I want to do the, to the best I can. Give me the power to do, because my will is to do and make you happy and please you. This is Jonathan Kahn. Thanks for watching. The Josiah Manifesto and all my books you can get anywhere. Amazon, wherever books are sold. Shalom.